It's time. We better hurry. The adventure begins here. Wait for me. But first, our explorers must check into the P.J. Putterman Library. Today's explorers are... Eric. Professor Putterman, to the information station, please. McKenna Louise. Kristen. All devices are now ready. After checking in, our explorers will make their way to the exploration station. Welcome to the exploration station. A little help from technology. And some instruction from me, Professor Putterman, school founder and world explorer. We're going to discover the heritage, the people, in every corner of our great country. Today they'll discover the Northeast. Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. Ah! I am so pleased you explorers could make it today. We have such treats in store for you. But first, let's see if you can guess where our adventure begins. Eric, go ahead. Touch the screen. Well, here goes. We're going to the ocean? Yes. But when? You're going to need some more clues. Let's go to the projection analyzer. McKenna, if you please. That's an old ship. Is it the Mayflower? Yes, it is the Mayflower. And the Mayflower is headed toward... Plymouth, Massachusetts, the northeastern region of the United States. Eric guessed it. Hey! That's right. That's where some of the first people to live in America landed. I'm not sure they were exactly the first ones here, Kristen. <sighs> McKenna is right. We're going to have to go back a little bit further before the first colonists settled this continent. Right location. Maybe this will help. Oh, who are you Indian? Native Americans. Ah. The first proud settlers of the Northeast. Let's start there. For hundreds of years, many Native American groups lived in the Northeast region, including the Pequot, the Wampanoag, and the Iroquois. The Iroquois were made up of five main tribes. They were the Seneca, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Cayuga, and the Onondaga. In 1722, the Tuscarora people joined the Iroquois to form the Iroquois Confederacy. A confederacy is a group of different people who joined together for a common goal. The land that would become New York State was home to many Iroquois villages. Iroquois villages were usually settled near a lake or a river so the tribe could take advantage of the rich natural materials that came from the earth. These natural resources provided food, clothing, and shelter. In 1620, a ship called the Mayflower carried pilgrims from England to the New World. They were searching for freedom to practice their religion. The ship arrived in the deep waters of a rocky bay. They named the bay Plymouth Bay, and it became the first settlement in the colony of Massachusetts. A colony is an area that is governed by the home country of its settlers. Plymouth was governed by England. The Pilgrims settled at Plymouth because of the area's rich resources. There was land for farming, timber for building homes, and plenty of fresh water. A Native American called Tisquantum became an interpreter between the colonists and the Wampanoag. Tisquantum was also known as Squanto. He and other Wampanoag helped the early colonists through their first year by showing them how to make better use of the vast resources that surrounded them. Without his instruction, the Plymouth colony might have failed. As settlements were established and beginning to flourish, more people journeyed to America and created colonies along the northeast coast. 
Soon, many of the settlements became centers for trade. Products made in Europe were traded or sold for goods from America, namely from New England. An explorer named John Smith, who had helped settle Jamestown Colony in the southeast, named this area after his home country, England. New England includes the areas that would later become the states of Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. Massachusetts became a popular trading center in New England, attracting thousands of colonists by the mid-1700s. As people moved to the colonies, it became even more important for them to make decisions as a community. The colonists held meetings to discuss and make decisions about their towns. Town meetings became very important in early New England. The town meeting was often held in a church or meeting house located on the common. A common is an area built in the center of town for everyone to use. To survive during the settling years of the colonies, people had to rely on each other and they had to grow or make what they needed. If not for the Native Americans, the colonists might not have survived. Tis Quantum was especially helpful. Kristen, can you get the map back? It's ready. See, Eric, most of the colonists came from England. What I want to know is why all those colonists left England in the first place, Professor? 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 Shh! Eric, up here. You see, Eric, they left England. Freedom. What is that? Trouble in the colonies. Gotta go. The colonies made such good use of local natural resources that many cities became centers for trade. Boston, in the Massachusetts colony, was one of the busiest cities. By the mid-1700s, the streets of Boston were lined with houses and shops. The harbor in Boston was filled with ships carrying goods, and England collected taxes on every item traded or sold. In the 1760s, colonists began to resent the heavy taxes placed upon them by the British rulers. So the colonists quit buying anything from England. They boycotted British goods. Eventually, the British king sent an army to the colonies to collect taxes and protect England's interests in the colonies. On one occasion, in 1770, colonists called Patriots clashed with the British soldiers and five unarmed Patriots were killed. This incident became known as the Boston Massacre. In 1773, colonists protested the British tax on tea by dressing up as Indians and dumping 342 chests of tea into the Boston Harbor. The Boston Tea Party united the colonists, but the British responded with more laws restricting the rights of the colonists. Growing tensions between the Patriots and the British caused the British to close the trading ports in Boston. As the ports closed, the Patriots began to prepare for battle. Some of these Patriots were known as Minutemen because they would be ready to fight at a minute's notice. Minutemen were common men who were willing to fight for their freedoms. April 18, 1775, the British Army was on the way to Concord, Massachusetts to capture a Patriot leader and destroy military supplies. Three Patriot men on horseback were selected to warn the surrounding countryside of the approaching British Army. One of these men, a silversmith from Boston named Paul Revere, managed to warn the Minutemen. When the British reached Lexington, they found Minutemen ready and waiting, then shots were fired. During this battle that continued on in Concord, 90 Patriot soldiers were either killed or wounded, but 250 British soldiers were killed or wounded. Word of the battle at Lexington and Concord spread throughout the colonies. The Patriots organized and were prepared to fight when more British troops arrived one month later. The Revolutionary War had begun. By 1783, almost eight years later, many battles had been fought and many lives lost. The Revolutionary War ended when the Treaty of Paris was signed, recognizing the United States as an independent country 
the Patriots had triumphed. Wow, once America was free, everyone wanted to live here, right? And explorers, where do you think most of them arrived when they reached this new world? The Northeast? That's right, but more specifically? New York. It says here, Ellis Island. You got it. Let's take a look. Immigrants began to arrive from northern European countries even before the Revolutionary War. These immigrants would travel by boat across the ocean and step onto American soil in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. After the United States gained independence from England, people from the Northeast region began to explore North America and move west to lands beyond the Appalachian Mountains. During that time, the largest wave of immigrants made their way across the Atlantic Ocean and settled in America. But between 1890 and 1914, millions of immigrants arrived from countries all over the world. These people came from Italy, Poland, Sweden, Russia, Norway, and many other countries. By this time, New York State had replaced Philadelphia as the main port for immigrants. And newcomers arriving by boat would catch a glimpse of the Statue of Liberty welcoming them to the United States. All immigrants entering the United States by the Atlantic Ocean between 1892 and 1954 had to first pass through the Ellis Island Immigration Center. Immigrants were checked by doctors to stop the spread of any disease and to see if they were healthy enough to work. After passing through Ellis Island, immigrants had to find work and a place to live. Most immigrants found housing in crowded apartments called tenements. The only jobs many immigrants could find were in the tightly packed city factories. Working conditions were often poor. Too many people crowded into too little space made these buildings hot and unhealthy. These factories became known as sweatshops. These sweatshops required long hours of work for very little pay, but even these jobs meant a new beginning for many immigrants. Although today life is still difficult for many immigrants, laws, including labor laws, have made living conditions better for people seeking a better life in America. America has now become known as the world's salad bowl because of the countless cultures and races that have come to call the United States home. Yet many groups still celebrate customs from their homelands. And some groups choose not to be a part of this cultural salad bowl. One of these groups is the Amish. The Amish live mostly in southeastern Pennsylvania. The Amish believe in separation from the world. They do not fight in wars or hold public office. And they do not use electricity, cars, telephones, or tractors. They use simple tools like horse pulled plows and even buggies. But people from all walks of life help make the Northeast one of the busiest regions in the United States. Although the Northeast has the smallest area of the five regions, it has the third largest population. This population is due to immigration from around the world. Immigration means a move to a country from outside the country. But people also move to the Northeast from inside the country. This is called migration. Between 1910 and 1930, many African Americans from the South moved to the Northeast in search of more freedom and opportunities. This was called the Great Migration. There was a boom of new jobs in the Northeast as machines were developed for transportation and manufacturing. This was all part of the Industrial Revolution and the Northeast region was the first place in the United States to experience it. By 1850, 10 American cities had populations of over 50,000 people. Seven of those cities were in the Northeast. In the 1920s, the populations of cities like New York and Philadelphia swelled. At the same time, the opportunities for easy transportation became more common. People could now work in the city, the urban areas, and still live in smaller communities outside the city, called suburbs. Wow, just think, from the Iroquois to today, the Northeast sure has grown. Yes, all kinds of different people. The growth in industry and freedom. So, Professor, can we go somewhere? Professor? The library will be closing in five minutes. Please take all your materials to the checkout desk.
and thank you for exploring the Northeast. Learning about the Northeast is pretty fun. Yeah, it's really interesting. Wait up, Kristen and Eric. Okay, come on. Discover and explore all the regions of the United States. Call 1-800-483-3383 or visit our website, schoolvideos.com, for 100% educational videos.